the last thing we should do as women or men is to jump the gun prematurely in a relationship because you want to have a child. Kat Harris, I love this woman, author of a book coming out soon, Sexless in the City, podcaster, educator, religious woman. And we talk about how hard it is being single, the challenges of being single, the challenges of the pressure of the biological clock, the options that you have as a woman who wants to have a child, but who also doesn't have a partner to have a child with. This is a beautiful open, fun, and deep episode. And I'm so, so grateful for Kat. My name is Sean Galanos, and this is The Love Drive. Kat. Sean. You ready? I'm ready. Could you introduce yourself, please? My name is Kat Harris. I run an online platform called The Refined Woman. I do relationship coaching. My first book is coming out this spring called Sexless in the City. It's all about me kind of growing up in conservative Christian culture and being taught a sexual script about who I am, what my body is, what is good or bad about sex, and then moving to New York City and kind of having a come to Jesus moment, uh, figuring out what I believe about God and sex and spirituality and all the things. And so that is coming out soon. I I still, even though I've been running my business for nine years and talking about it, I am so bad at elevator pitches. I'm like, I love Beyonce. And... <laughs> ranch dressing. And I love supporting women to really be free and whole and grounded in their worth and identity and value from the inside out. So I do that through the podcast, through the blog, through the book, through online courses and fun stuff like that. Why are you still single? Oh my gosh. That is like such a triggering question to ask just being a single person. (laughs) Um, good thing that I am really grounded in um, who I am and, <laughs> and my worth. I mean, you know, I asked that for a very specific reason. Yeah. So I think a lot of things. I think up until this point, there have, first of all, I could be with someone right now. I, I told my friend just recently was like, we got to find you a man. Let's go out. Like this was just a few days ago. And I said, I could have a man. I could go up to that guy at the bar right there and make out with him. That's not what I want. Yep. I am looking for a serious, committed, monogamous, long-term relationship that leads towards marriage. I want to have children. I want to be with a partner that is on vision and on point in their lives. And so I think I'm super clear about what I want and that might slim down the dating pool a little bit. I would say also in my, my twenties were sort of that decade. I'm like, thank God I didn't get what I wanted when I wanted it. Mm. I mean, I attracted emotionally unavailable, narcissistic, addictive type personality men in my life like a moth to the flame. And the only reason why I am single and not with one of those guys is because they ended up rejecting me. Mm. And only in hindsight am I so, so grateful that when I didn't have the courage to walk away, several of these men that I would have said yes to in a heartbeat ended up rejecting me. So I spent time in my late 20s to early 30s just doing a lot of as cliche as it sounds, the work, going to therapy, doing emotional intelligence workshops and retreats, and really identifying the patterns in my life. Because for so long, it was easy for me to say, well, I'm single because there aren't guys out there that share my values that I'm also attracted to. I'm single because 
I'm not a size two. I'm single because I, I, I felt like such a victim to my relationship status. And I think really I got to this point where I, I felt if I'm single because that is the plan that God and the divine have for me. Thank you, God. I have a beautiful life. I have purpose. I am pursuing wholeness and I have a really incredible life that I'm living. But if I'm in my own way, that's something that I can do something about. So I spent a lot of time really healing the the trauma of my past and and really taking responsibility for how I was showing up. Now, why am I single today on <laughs> January 2021? I just haven't met my person yet. Okay, so if there is a person, there may not be a person. Uh, there, there may not be a person. There's a, there's, okay. a good, there's a good chance that there's a person. Yeah. I wasn't actually expecting you to answer that question. I thought we were going to talk about um, how I'm really glad you did, and I have a lot of things to say about it. Yeah. I thought we were going to talk about the posts and the videos that you made around how to answer that question when when your family members ask you around the holidays, like, "Why are you so single?" or, mm. or "Why are you still single?" Not so yeah. single. Um, Got it. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that you I love that you answered it. And it, and it is it's like an it's kind of an insulting question. Yeah. Um I'm a little surprised that you thought that I was asking you that like seriously. Well, I knew I knew you were asking it because I've talked about it and perhaps I should have clarified how you wanted me to answer it. But I mean, yeah, I just I decided to go with my gut. <laughs> I, I love the way you answered it. I, I was actually thinking about this as a question for you and sort of my thoughts around it and or how I would answer that question. Yeah. And I what I came up with on my walk this morning was the more vulnerable, the better. Mm. Right. There, there's always like a way to make a joke out of it. Mm -hmm. Well, because I don't want to end up with a loser like, you know, the guy you married. Yeah. Right. Or like there's a way that, to like really get defensive or to hurt the other person uh, or to brush it off. And what I came up with was like, oh, the, the more vulnerable, the better. Mm. Right. The more intimate, the better. And yeah. your answer is, is, is that, you know, like, oh, it, it just hadn't worked out for me. Yeah. I've been working on my shit. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, I don't know why I'm still single or, mm -hmm. you know, I want this and I have high standards. Mm -hmm. Right. Not with any sort of like uh, arrogance or filled with ego, but just like this is my truth. Yeah, I think yeah. I think there's a lot of people that are still single. Like, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I could very well be single. Right. Mm -hmm. I was single for like seven out of the last like 10 years or maybe I guess that number has changed now since time has gone by. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been single a lot. Like in my 30s, I was like mostly single in my 30s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think the hard part about that question that I I really want to challenge, and I think with most questions, you have the question and then you have the question underneath the question. Why are you single? What's underneath that question is what's wrong with you? Mm. Underneath that question is an assumption that my value, my worth as a woman, and I'm this might feel controversial to you, but as a as women there's just a different pressure put on us than than the male experience of being in a relationship if if the only reason is because we have a biological clock although i think there's way more way more reasons to that but i think the assumption is that i will become more valuable when I'm in a relationship, my life will start when I meet person X, I will be better with my finances, I will be a more whole human being, my life will begin. And so I think so much of the, again, all I know is my experience growing up in America, is I feel like so much of our culture revolves around marriage and the nuclear family. And I will be the first one to say that I long for partnership. I want to have a baby with my own body with a man that I am in a committed marriage relationship with. That might not be what everyone else wants, but that's what I desire. And and if that doesn't happen, I will be really sad. But it also says nothing about my worth or value mm -hmm. if that doesn't happen. And so I think so much of you know, being in the coaching space and the dating space, I feel like there's so many painful and damaging like sub narratives below the questions we ask. I 100% agree. 
agree. I, I'm just like, I'm lost in the beauty of, <laughs> of your story. <laughs> I'm also thinking like, yeah, that's not a very controversial statement that like, <laughs> you know, women are expected to be in relationship and, and their value, some of their value still to this day in 2021, um, comes from the ability to home make and raise children and have children. And that's not, it's so not controversial because I'm watching Bridgerton right now. Yes. Oh my gosh. Like that's their only value in like the 1800s is their ability to, to like have children and, Mm -hmm. and like home make and host parties and. (laughs) Well, even watching it, I don't know if you feel this way, but I did a whole thing on my social media. Careful, careful. I'm only two, two episodes in. Okay, okay, so I thank you. I I live and die by not wanting to spoil or alert anything because I love surprises. Well, you're gonna live today, then. I will live. So I think so. This is a zero spoiler alert situation. It's more when you watch Bridgerton, you're noticing the cultural dynamics of women, or not even women. These girls are teenagers who come of age and are presented to society, and their whole existence is led up to this moment of, I am out in society. You may marry me now. These women are expected to be quote unquote, pure, undefiled virgins. And meanwhile, the men who are pursuing them are much older than them because the pressure on them to be in a relationship is not the same as it is a woman. They're not quote unquote pure. They're allowed to sleep around and fuck around and do whatever. And I feel like, yes, this is a commentary of how it was, but it doesn't honestly seem that different today. (laughs) I mean, I think even in today's culture, women aren't really accepted as being sexual beings in the same way that men are accepted to be sexual beings. We still put onus on women to cover our bodies because boys will be boys. And when we say stuff like that, we're, it's like a little one step higher than saying you asked for it if you receive unwanted advances. And so I'm watching it and I love it and I can't wait for you to watch the whole thing. (laughs) And it doesn't, something about it just feels still really familiar to the air we breathe today. I know it's, we have come so far and yet not so far at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Someone on Instagram asked me if I think dating is worse now than it was before. And my argument was like, debutante balls. (laughs) Like... (laughs) And then someone else said, well, they still have those to to this day. And I was like, fuck, fuck. Oh my gosh. I wanted to be a debutante. (laughs) I I don't even know what what that is. So debutante and coming out in society is still a huge thing in the South. I, I had a few of my super rich friends growing up that were debutantes. You go through this whole thing. You wear a wedding dress. When you're 16, 17, get presented to society. Actually... Uh, the there's a stand-up comedian, Fortune Feimster, where she talks about <laughs> going through debutante, and it's crazy, but it still it totally still happens. And yeah, I definitely wanted to be a debutante when I was growing up in Texas. <laughs> nice um, tennis buff pro yeah. slash debutante, totally <laughs> um, slash beanpole. Like I'm a feminist, but I totally want to be a debutante. <laughs> <laughs> like I want to, go, I want to go back to something that you said when you're when I asked you, you know, why you're still single. Yeah. Um, you said that you wanted to work on yourself, right? Quote unquote, do the work. You wanted to heal a lot of your patterns, mm-hmm. and uh, you kind of wanted to set yourself up, yeah, right, as a more healthy person. And how old are you now? Thirty-five. Thirty-five. Do you think that? doing all that work makes it harder for you to find a counterpart that's around the same age that's also done the same amount of work? Mm. I have a two-part answer to that question. Okay. (laughs) One is no, because I think so much of our mindset determines our reality. And if I choose to believe that I'm doing all this work and there's not all those other people out there. They're not doing the work. They're slim pickings. Then everything <laughs> that does or doesn't happen becomes evidence. Sure. For the narrative that I've, I'm committed to. It's the bottom of the barrel. Yeah. So, okay. So I think in that sense, no, I think that there are plenty of healthy 
grounded men in the, uh, emotionally, spiritually, physically, all the things, men of integrity, men of vision. Um, and I think they're out there. I know that because I know people like you, I have guy friends in my life. I have friends that have partners that are incredible. So my first part of the answer is no. Cool. The second part of my answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like the worst at like the this or that <laughs> questions on personality tests. I'm like, well, but like, what's the context? It's nuanced. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Me too. And so I think where I say yes to that, and one of my girlfriends and I were talking about this recently, I think I had this belief that the more I sort of healed my past, the more I released trauma and blah, 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 like do the work, I thought life would get easier. And in some senses it does because I have tools now to work through my past or work through when I'm feeling a panic attack coming on or whatever the thing may be, or identify, oh, I'm on this date with this person. And within two sentences, he is really shown me that we are really out of alignment and what we're looking for. And so I actually don't need to go on five more dates with this person. I don't even need to finish the date. No, great. It was so nice to meet you. <laughs> Best of luck to you. The, the so last I, few things you said are just not going to work for me. <laughs> great. Bye. <laughs> um, but I do, I think what I've experienced is I thought life would get easier. And I think sometimes working through your shit can make life harder mm. because I feel like sometimes I miss like the ignorance of, yeah. you know, oh, like when I dairy, my stomach hurts. <laughs> like, Oh, well, that's know, not oh, connected. Well. I did it. I'd be like, oh, my stomach hurts. That's weird. Let me go on a run. And so I think it can make it harder. I don't even know if I like that terminology. I think more so what I'll say is maybe it means that there are less people in the dating pool that I'm interested in going out with. Sure. I mean, even from this sheer fact, and we haven't even talked about this, that I'm choosing to not have sex until marriage. So is that, you know. is that like a lifelong thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Wait, are you a virgin? Well, it, would, it depends on what you mean by virgin, but there has never been a penis inside me. So yes. <laughs> it, what about <laughs> inside you? There are many ways of putting a right. penis inside somebody. Right. So... It <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking the hard questions. Yeah. So, I mean, what I talk about in my book is I, for most of my life, just considered penis and vagina is what sex is. And as long as I stayed away from that, then I was like doing quote unquote God's best for me. And now I believe that sex is more of a pool of experiences. And for sure. So for me, by my own definition, I'm not a virgin anymore, um, but I still am choosing to abstain until marriage. And that's a whole other story because the whole reason why I wrote the book was because I feel like I got to this place in my life where I was like, I have no idea why I'm doing this thing. Is it just because I was told to? What is it? How? how I felt like such a victim to external expectations and religious expectations. And I, I really had no idea why I was not having sex. And so I went on a whole kind of like multi-year journey of figuring out what do I believe about sex and why and how can I take agency and ownership over how I'm showing up. And I feel like the big joke that was on me as I like ended that journey <laughs> being like, actually, I think I still want to do this. So there's that. Wow. Questions, comments, concerns. <laughs> uh, no concerns. Um, so P and <laughs> P and <laughs> so no P and the V. <laughs> so P and the A. P and the A. Um, no. I mean, maybe in. I feel like maybe in marriage, if I feel really safe and want that. But honestly, I feel like all of my friends who do are we allowed to say it? Because I I feel like. Anal I, just, I, anal I don't want to make your your podcast explicit, but anal, anal, yeah. So anal sex. Um, <laughs> I feel like almost all my friends that have anal sex are like, I have to like gear myself up for it and like really mentally prepare. And I'm like, it sounds like you don't really like it. <laughs> right. It sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> so I'm not like opposed to trying things out when I'm married, but I'm not doing that as a single person. No. Oh, but you haven't had anal sex. 
No, I haven't. I was just sort of, I was sort of assuming that you had done everything but be in the V, <laughs> be in the v. <laughs> as like a way to you know like play within the lines mm -hmm. like yeah. this is the sandbox the sandbox doesn't <laughs> include vaginal penetration but it certainly includes all these other things that's yes. like my my hope my fantasy mm -hmm. basically <laughs> well a lot of that's how a lot of people choose to do it and actually through all my research and writing writing the book there's this a New York Times writer called her name is Peggy Ornstein and she has a book called Girls and Sex and then another book called Boys and Sex and she she one one section is about people who commit to quote unquote abstinence have like the highest rate of STDs, the highest rate of unwanted pregnancies. Oh. And the statistics of anal sex are astronomically higher than people who don't commit to abstinence. So it's it's definitely it's a great question because a lot of people who are like, oh no, I'm not having sex, but I'm, you know, having anal sex. I have zero judgment for that. I think so much of what I want to challenge is like, why do we believe what we believe about sex? And where do we come up with our definition of sex? And what is it that I really want? What feels good to my body? What feels honoring to myself and the person that I'm having a sexual encounter with? Yeah. I'm going to agree without any sort of scientific or data backed, you know, evidence or whatever mm -hmm. that, uh, that will make it a little bit harder. Yeah. I think the fact that you're waiting until marriage, which mm -hmm. I obviously have no judgment against, mm -hmm. but one of the things that I've come to find is that like the higher our standards, the less people will be able to meet them. Mm -hmm. And that there's nothing wrong with high standards. Mm -hmm. Like I, I really want people to have high standards if that's what they want, mm -hmm. but to have low expectations that mm -hmm. people will be able to meet those standards in a, a timeline that works for them, mm -hmm. right? And I think you and I also both have quite a bit of faith, mm -hmm. right? Um, you are a woman of the faith. Is that, <laughs> did I say that right? A woman of the cloth. <laughs> what is it called? <laughs> a woman of the cloth. <laughs> you, you have faith that like you're on the right path, regardless of, whether a man shows up or when he shows up and what he shows up for. Is that right? I, yeah. I don't even know if I would say I feel like I'm on the right path. I just believe I'm on the path that I'm choosing to be on. Yeah. And that feels good and authentic and true to me. And I, I have the same faith that like I'm on the path. I'm exactly where I need to be right now. Mm -hmm. Everything that has happened to me and with me has led me to be who I am today. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have any regrets for the things that have happened or the things that I've done, but a lot of people would be very regretful <laughs> of having done mm -hmm. um, because they've led me to, to this moment right now. Yeah. Me talking to Kat. Absolutely. And if I and hadn't I... gotten arrested <laughs> in 2005 for stealing a sound card from Electronics Superstore, <laughs> we might not be here. You know, it's kind of like the butterfly effect. <laughs> it is the but I guess that is the bu butterfly. It is the effect. butterfly effect. I mean, yeah, everything that has to happen, every single moment, breath of missed up or not missed up. I mean, that's why I don't really, I don't know that I really believe in regrets. I mean, yes, there are things that I've chosen to do and things that have been done to me that are super painful and decisions that I've participated with that I don't want to do again. But I agree with you. Everything that has or hasn't happened, every choice, every thought, every movement has led me to where I am today. And I'm so grateful for it. I saw a photo on the internet of a guy that has like no, <laughs> no regret tattooed on his neck, but it was, it was misspelled and it says no, no regrets, which... <laughs> That might be a regret, you know? That's amazing. <laughs> okay, so you're 35 and you want to have kids. Yeah, I do. And I think that there's there are people that find themselves in that position. Mm -hmm. Like biologically are starting to get worried, mm -hmm. right? Especially if you want to have kids. What did you, how did you say it? Using your own body? Yeah, like having a child from my body from my body with mm -hmm. a partner mm -hmm. and i think that th it 
it can get tricky when you're attached to with a partner. Yeah. And people, women, uh, say this often. Yeah, but, you know, I, I don't have the options mm-hmm. or the the privilege of choosing just the right partner. I would, I, I'm super paraphrasing here. Because I'm on an advanced timeline mm-hmm. or I have a limited timeline to have a child on my own with someone else, I can't be as picky as I want to be. Mm. So I might have to lower my standards hmm. if I want to meet that need, the biological need of having a child with someone. Hmm. And for me, as a 38-year-old dude who doesn't have those biological limits, uh, instantly I'm like thinking, well, you can have a kid without a partner. Yeah. And then worry about the partner later. Mm-hmm. And to me, that makes sense. Like, that's like a very logical way of looking at it. Mm-hmm. Um, because there are people that are going to want to be with you even if you have a kid. Like, I have so many friends that broke up, are single parents, and met someone after that is like, oh, cool, you have a kid. Or I have I have kids too. Now we have more kids. And, or I love your kid. I, I, I never wanted my own kid, but like, I love your kid. So... Mm-hmm. I for I see that there's another way, mm-hmm. and I think that for some people, like that's just not an option. It, it it would be preferable to settle with someone who's not a great fit, but have a kid with them, than it is to uh, have a child and then worry about that great relationship. Yeah, I mean, oh, I think yes, of course, one hundred percent, and in that. I think it's just really important to acknowledge the experience of, of the woman, you know, even, even myself this year, I'm 35 years old. I am so grateful that up until this point, I have not had the relationship, the children, even though I wanted that when I was 20 years old, Mm. because if I would have gotten that, I never would have lived out of a van and traveled all over the U S worked in Uganda like traveled all over Europe, just lived in New York, done all these things and got to meet all these people and have my worldview shifted and shaped. And I'm so glad I didn't get that. And also this last year, for whatever reason, was really the first year that I started being like, wow, like I just thought, I just thought it would have happened by now. Mm. And it's okay that it hasn't. And it's also okay to, yes, there's options. And I think it's dismissive to kind of go straight to that point without saying, I'm so sorry that you haven't gotten the relationship, the partner, the family, and the way that you initially wanted. And just really validating the disappointment there. Mm. Because I think until we let ourselves grieve the what hasn't happened yet or how it didn't happen, then we can't really move forward holy, like Mm. from a holistic place. And so, yes, I am grateful my life is where it's at. And I'm also surprised and there's disappointment. I recently left New York City after almost a decade. And one of the huge, I was excited about that. I had, I bought my first property last year. That felt really exciting. And I also had to let myself process the grief of, I never thought I would be 35 leaving New York City single Mm. and not being a mother yet. And so, yeah, are there options? Yes. And I think first we have to let ourselves grieve. And then the question I always ask myself is, if I was coming from a place of wholeness and freedom and love, how would I be showing up and asking this question? So when I hear the rhetoric of what you're saying of, I can't, there's no options, I have to settle because I'm on this timeline, I think all I hear underneath that is fear, lack, victim, scarcity. Mm. And what would it be like to show up to this conversation around fertility from a place of agency, ownership, connected to hope, possibility? And when I show up from that place, yeah, do I still 
want to meet a partner and have a baby with my own body? Yes. And I think it's important that we give ourselves permission to be really clear about what it is that we want, because knowing what we want in the future helps us walk out the present with vision and integrity and, um, and freedom. However, then it's like most things. So you say what you want and then you get to surrender it and let go of it. And I think the beautiful part of where we're at in our culture and our world is that as women, we finally do have options. And so even when you say, yeah, you could, you could have a baby your own way. You don't need another person. Like what you also get to remember is this is the first time in human history in the last 20, 30 years where that's really even ever been an option for women. We are more college educated than we've ever been. We have more jobs, more money, more, more rights than we've ever had. And so even back to Bridgerton, if that would have happened, that was only 100, 200 years ago. And that woman would have been outcast from society. So yes, that's a logical option, but it's still so new. And I think also our sex ed system has really failed us. I'm 35 and only in the last few years have I started learning about what my options are. Okay. So what can I do? I started doing AMH testing, which is a super accessible way to figure out the, the health of your eggs and the amount of viable eggs that you have. And so then after you get your AMH tested, you can kind of make a game plan of, do I want to freeze my eggs? And really it wasn't until I started opening my mind to, yes, I want it to happen this way. And I want to know what my options are. Now I can make a more holistic decision. I didn't know until I started looking at the options and being more open to a different way that, oh, my body can actually carry a baby to full term until my early 50s. I have no idea. I'm learning You're, something today. Yeah. I mean, it's fascinating. Um, I I had a conversation with one of the top fertility specialists in America on my podcast, and I can send it to you to link in your notes, but I learned, I learned so much from this woman. But yeah, our bodies as women can carry babies to full term and healthy babies until we're in our 50s. However, our eggs, once we hit 35, start the possibility for... Um, more like genetic issues or deformities or whatever, but the, the risk increases. And so that's at the point where, you know, you're in your late twenties, early thirties, 35, 36 or seven, 38, those are really great times to freeze your eggs. And even if you're like, I'm 28 years old, I don't even know if I want to have kids. 27 to 30 year olds are at the best time to freeze their eggs. Cause the reality is maybe you don't even want to think about having kids until you're 42. And then when you're 42, you can try to have a child the natural way. You can do IVF or you can use your eggs that were frozen 10 years ago or five years ago. And so those are options. Foster care is another wonderful option. Adoption. Um, and yes, I, it still is like, well, yeah, I still want it this one way. But yes, I also have multiple friends that are single parents now. And I mean, I think for me personally, something that I have been just walking through myself and my own fertility journey and learning is realizing, okay, so if I were to have a child on my own, what would be the timeline for that? Financially, where would I need to be for that to be a reality? If it isn't a reality, what then what I need to do, what I need to move in with my parents, like just to really, really tease it out as opposed to kind of living from the space that I'm so attached to it happening, happening this way. And if it doesn't happen this way, then it's not going to happen. I just think in almost every area of life, there are options and that might be hard because we have to deal with the disappointment and grief of the, our number one choice not coming to pass. But I definitely think the last thing we should do as women or men is to jump the gun prematurely in a relationship because you want to have a child. Like, don't do that. Yes. (laughs) That that like doesn't serve anyone. (laughs) Wow. You are so good. Holy shit. (laughs) I've been sitting on the edge of my, my rolling chair here. Um, I, I loved so much about that. I love this idea of like grieving your desire, mm. right? Like I thought I was supposed to have two kids by 30 because that's what my parents had. 
Mm-hmm. And here I am, 38, zero kids, mm-hmm. you know, and it's just beautiful to say, yeah, okay, you're, you're presenting a logical option, but first let's talk about the disappointment. Yeah. Let's talk about the grief mm-hmm. around this dream that you had that might not happen, but that also might happen differently, mm-hmm. right? Like you started talking about um, IVF and all these different ways, but I hadn't even considered uh, fostering or adoption. Mm-hmm. Like that they didn't really even come into my my brain space. Mm-hmm. Um, so thank you for all yeah. of that. I can tell how how effective of a coach you are. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, I mean, I think it's I think what I've realized in my own life is that it's just so easy to kind of go to like fix it mode, right? Mm. And I am like the queen of that. And just going, even just the fertility stuff for me, it was the friends, the mentors in my life that kind of walked me through because a a huge thing, I felt really blocked from leaving New York because I was like, I can't leave New York single. It felt like a failure. And I felt like if I can't meet someone in New York. (laughs) I mean, New York is a hard place to meet people because it's full of New Yorkers who are like too busy and too cool for school. Yes. There's, I think dating is hard wherever you go. I think numbers wise, I thought it would maybe be easier. Mm. However, after living there and doing, I'm like a total research girl. I love statistics. (laughs) And I found out for every heterosexual male, college, every college educated heterosexual male in New York City, there are two college educated heterosexual females. You heard that, boys? Uh, yeah. Head so, to New York. <laughs> <laughs> and the the reverse of that, the so a great place for women to live if you want to be around more men than women is a place like Colorado. They call it like Menver instead of Denver and then San Francisco, all the tech. But Mantana. This, what is it? Mantana. Mantana. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, dating in New York was harder than I thought. But yeah, I really had to give myself permission to to grieve that. And then you can make the game plan of like, okay, I'm not a victim to my circumstances. I actually wouldn't have wanted it any other way. I'm so glad I didn't get married to the guy I almost got engaged to five years ago. Like, Lord have mercy, that would have been such a toxic relationship. And I'm so glad I don't have a child with him. That would have made things 10 times more complicated. And the child, the effect on the child? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Been really tough. Yeah. So I think once I allowed myself to grieve, I could actually see I'm actually really glad my life hasn't turned out the way I, I wanted it to, the way I thought it should, could, whatever. And then that allows me to be open to what if even in this, my desire for partnership and children, I think this is the best option. But what if on the other side of being open to possibility, I could look back in hindsight like I can in almost every other area of my life and say, I'm so glad it didn't happen the way I thought it was supposed to happen. Yeah, it's true. Mm-hmm. Like, I didn't know what was going to lead me to this point, this mm-hmm. moment. Mm-hmm. And I'm always surprised, like pleasantly surprised of how my life has turned out. Mm-hmm. And it's been a very circuitous journey, even with my relationship. Like, Mm -hmm. I I just could never have planned this out. Yeah. What do you mean by circuitous? I've literally never heard that word in my life. It's a good one, right? It's like (laughs) just, you know, not a straight path, Mm. not a point A to B. It goes all the way, like you said earlier, it goes from here to there, kind of a non sequitur situation. Yeah. The way I met my girlfriend is that I was on OkCupid in Montreal Mm -hmm. and I met someone who was a 99% match. And I was like, I I found her. (laughs) I found my soulmate. She was like a sex coach and was like, kind of looked like me and was kind of, you know, has like all these things. Like short buzzed hair. (laughs) Yeah, she had short gray hair, gray (laughs) hair. Um, And then we met and there was just like, not there. You know, whatever I thought was going to be there wasn't there, right? I had expectations of of how our connection was going to be based on OkCupid's okay algorithm and based on like how badly I wanted to be in a relationship. Mm. And this woman, uh, while we weren't a great fit romantically, we were totally a great fit platonically. Mm-hmm. And she was into 
uh, like play parties, sex parties. Mm, um, interesting. Yeah, and you can't just like show up at a sex party. You need to be invited to sex parties, and they're closed communities for a reason because they're they're, you know, you want to stay. You want you want to control who who comes into the community to make sure they respect consent and they're playful and they're open and authentic and communicative and and all that stuff. So she told me about these parties and it took me months to like come back and say like, Oh, if next time you go, you know, I'd love to be invited or included or something. And eventually after months and months of me saying her inviting me and me saying no, I finally said yes. And I went to this party and it was like a very tame sex party, but that's where I met my girlfriend. Um, no and she was there with her girlfriend at the time. They were in an open relationship. And then, you know, it took us a year. I mean, we didn't have sex for a year. It was Wait, a year. What? Yeah, a year of courtship. <laughs> courtship. That's like that's like Unheard a of. thousand years. And, and I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> in a man's world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Especially a man that like looks like me and does what I do. Uh, <laughs> people have a lot like they really make up stories about how I am and, and oh, the way I live my life. But <laughs> she was in a relationship. Mm-hmm. You know, It was an open relationship, but like barely. Right. Mm-hmm. So we were able to like see each other every now and then. She also traveled a lot and didn't have a lot of time. She was fully unavailable. Mm-hmm. Like, and so I'd sort of written her off as like a pipe dream, you know, mm-hmm. like never going to happen. And we also had a friend in common and her, and her friend kept on saying like, uh, you know, I, I'd, <laughs> I'd keep my hopes up, you know, I, I'd stay open to the yeah. opportunity. I was like, really? Okay, cool. That's fun. <laughs> and it really took a long time, long, long time. And so the way that my girlfriend and I met is like very circuitous, you know, mm-hmm. never would have thought it would come from meeting someone who wasn't a match on OkCupid to months of, you know, maybe going to a party to finally meeting her on this one day. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, I don't know how it's going to fucking plan out or turn out. Yeah. I don't. And I think that's beautiful about love and about relationship and human connection is we all want the formula. We want to know, okay. We would be I, billionaires if oh. we had the formula. <laughs> So people ask me like, "Why are you still single?" I'm like, "You think if I knew the formula, like I would, I would know there's no formula." It would be it me, you, and Elon. Oh my gosh! And Just Jeff swimming, swimming in the billions, <laughs> swimming in the billions. Seriously, I think we yes. would be billionaires if we knew the formula to mm-hmm. to love and to to lasting, committed, loving relationships. Mm-hmm. So, can I ask you a question? No, this is a one-way situation. Cool, I thought yeah. so. Okay, go ahead. Break the law. Break it. <laughs> Break the law. So with you and your girlfriend. That's right. Do you, so you said to you guys, it was a year until you guys had sex. That's right. And she was un- emotionally unavailable in another relationship for a lot of that time. Were you like, I just want to be friends with her. If it happens, it happens. Or were you in the mindset of I'm waiting, I want to, I really want to give it a shot with this person. How did it transition into an actual relationship? And did it, was it sex first and then relationship or relationship then sex? I never wanted to be friends. Mm -hmm. I have zero interest in being friends with someone that I want to be in a relationship with or to sleep with. Mm -hmm. Like if friendship is the only thing that's available, (laughs) <laughs> like I and I want more like I'm unlikely to stick around yeah. because it's too painful yeah not because I don't need more friends I always need more friends but it's painful it's really hard to spend time with someone when you want more than they're able to give you mm-hmm. I'm just not woke enough I am not I will say no thank you I want more than that good luck good life best to you in all your endeavors <laughs> yeah totally yeah <laughs> best of luck in all your endeavors <laughs> Um, so the way I positioned it was, I remember early on, I I told her like, I want to be with you. And she was like, what does that mean? Because she's French Canadian. And so like it didn't, but we speak English together a lot. And, uh, so it didn't really translate. And so I had to tell her like, I want to like be in a relationship with you. And she was already in a relationship, Mm -hmm. you know? So like, it was just. She was like, I can't be like, I can kind of be like, we can be lovers, but we can't be in a relationship and and being lovers is a kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. And I told her basically like, I'm, I'm willing to stick around and explore what develops between us. Just know that like, this is what I want. 
And it was hard for me to name that for a long time. Mm-hmm. So for a long time, like she'd say, she'd say things like, I really see myself as being like a beautiful addition to your life. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh, I don't want you to be an addition. Like, I want you to be part of it. You know, like I want us to build a life together. I don't want you to be like an add on to a house that I already have. But I couldn't say that. Like, I, I just didn't feel comfortable. I was also scared of scaring her away. And eventually, I just like through a lot of work with my therapist. My therapist was like, oh, I wonder what would happen if you told her how you really felt about her. And slowly but surely, I was like more bold about mm-hmm. telling her what I wanted. And I said, look, I want to be with you. Like, that's that's just the way it is. And I'm willing to explore to see see like what develops between us. But if at some point you don't see a future with me, then you need to tell me right away. And in the meantime, I'll take care of myself. I know you're in a relationship. It's kind of a rocky one. I know things are complicated. I know you don't have a lot of space for me. I'll take care of myself as long as you tell me as soon as you figure out there's no future for us. And she was like, okay, I can do that. And I would I repeated that like almost every month. Hmm. I checked in about where I was at and what I wanted and and would ask her, you know, and she would answer to the best of her ability. And it was hard. It was really, really hard to like be in that in-between stage. Mm. And that in-between stage lasted two years. Oof, that is hard. Yeah. After we had sex, there still wasn't like, there was really a lack of commitment for a long time. Mm-hmm. And part of me is like, oh yeah, I'm the love coach guy. So I, I, you know, I get to go through these hard experiences so that <laughs> so that others don't have to. But but I'll be the first to say that it was really, really challenging. And all I did was, you know, bring it back to the present moment and have a lot of faith that my path is the right path. Mm-hmm. I don't know how it's going to turn out. I trust that God and the universe and my higher power has my best interests in mind. And I am here to learn. Mm-hmm. Whatever I'm learning through all of this will serve me in the present and in the future. And luckily for me, you know, I was uh, eventually rewarded with (laughs) commitment and uh, stability, but it's not even that stable still. Like still I I have to remember to bring it back to the present moment and that my relationship could end at any point. Mm -hmm. Like today it could be over. Yeah, I haven't checked my phone yet. I don't know. It might be done. (laughs) She might've broken up with me. And that's, that's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Like, I think people, you know, going back to marriage, people really want that commitment. Mm-hmm. But if you look at the divorce rates, I mean, I think it's actually declining, but they're not great. Yeah. Marriage doesn't mean that they'll never leave you. Having kids doesn't mean they're never going to leave you. Right. We're not guaranteed forever love from one person, except for ourselves. Right. And, and God. Mm-hmm. And maybe Jesus, if you believe in Jesus. <laughs> Right? Yeah. But not another human being. Mm. We're just, we just can't. That's, that's too risky. I think that's too risky. Yeah. I mean, I love everything. I think what's really stood out to me about what you shared is getting to a place where you could communicate and really own, this is where I'm at. This is what I want. And I, I'm responsible for my own heart. So you're not putting the blame on someone else for, for what they do or do not do to your heart. You're taking ownership for your heart and, and taking care of, of yourself. And then also just being so honest with what it is that you want. Mm. And then knowing here's my threshold. And then I just think, I mean, I feel like you're talking so much about the idea of consent. And I think, It's so, I think what you're saying, that sounds so vulnerable, even as you were sharing, this is what I said to her. I'm like, man, that took so much courage. And I wonder how our world and relationships would change if we just had the audacity to say, actually, I can't be your friend. I don't want to be your friend because I want to have sex with you. Hmm. Or I, I'm romantically attracted to you, and so I'm not interested in friendship. But we self-preserve, or we think the other person's winning if they know this about us, or we feel weak, or we don't want rejection, and or is God forbid it's going to be awkward. And so I think I just I just feel like it would literally transform our relationships if we were able to own that. And I think also releasing 
pressure from another human being to be our be all end all. I mean, God, I feel like so many relationships don't work out because you're like, you are the one, the one I have been waiting for and meet all my needs. Yes. Be, you have to commit to me for the rest of my life and forever. And I just think we just have no idea what's going to happen. Yes, I can say I commit to this. I I want a long-term relationship. I I do want to be married. However, like no other human being was ever designed or put on this earth to meet my needs. Also, what if being with them for the rest of your life ends up being a nightmare? Yeah. You don't know how people are going to grow. They might grow mm-hmm. funny. Yeah. And they might really not want what you want anymore. Yeah. I think it's 100% possible for people to change. Sure. I totally do. We change all the time. We're constantly evolving. And I think more so what I'm looking for is like a humility and a growth mindset. And, And I think also in dating, I think because I grew up with a, a father who struggles with addiction, I was the queen of getting in relationships with guys who I would see like their potential or who they were 10% of the time, which was gold and fall in love with that person and then hope that they would change and morph and choose to be the 10%, 20% of the time and then 30% of the time and then 40% of the time. And I think in my own journey, I got to a place where like, I think we are who we are, who we choose to be the majority of the time. Yeah. And who we choose to, I think we're constantly making choices, big and small, that are setting us on a a trajectory to become either light or darkness, like Mm -hmm. wholeness or more fracturedness or whatever. And so, I mean, it's 100. I mean, I just had a recent conversation with my dad and it's like the relationship we used to have isn't there anymore. And that's okay because we can have a new relationship. Like just because it's changed doesn't mean it is gone forever. Mm. Am I making any sense? Yeah, no, totally. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> well, like, I was just sometimes I sometimes I wonder if I sound like a mad scientist, and I'm like, it makes sense in my head. <laughs> no, it 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 does make sense, and and I think what we want to be careful with, and and I I don't think that you have an issue with this, is that like let's say you meet someone and you really want to have kids, mm-hmm. and they're like, yeah, I don't want kids. Mm-hmm. Hoping that they're going to change their mind mm-hmm. down the road is risky. Yes. Much riskier than saying, cool, man. God bless. What mm-hmm. is it? Good luck to you and all your endeavors. <laughs> bless you. Good luck to you and all your endeavors. <laughs> and and then, you know, go doing the next bit alone mm-hmm. and then trying again. I think that's less risky mm-hmm. than going all in on someone who says they don't want what you want. Yeah. That's th- th- those are the kind of changes that I wouldn't hold my breath on. Yeah. They could though. He could, yeah, totally. for sure, 3 years down the road just be head over heels with you and then his brother as a kid and then he's playing with the nephew and he's like I want one of my own. Totally. That could yeah. totally happen. And and if it does, I think I would if <laughs> if you know of someone who had that that story, I would consider that anecdotal. Mm-hmm. Not like data driven. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I think what happens is we hear what we want to hear. And we, I think, I really think if we love someone, but we have an, a, a subconscious or, or we just have an agenda that one day they'll change to be more like me, to want children, to want to move here or whatever, I don't really know that that's love. It feels a little bit like manipulation. A lot bit. A lot bit. Either I take, you know, I take what this person is saying, here's who I am, here's who I'm choosing to be, here's the path that I'm choosing to go on right now, here's what I want, what I don't want, and like I either get to take them at their word or not. Mm. And I think even when going back to your conversation of you saying to your girlfriend, I want to be in a relationship with you, this is what I want, and this is what I'm willing to do. And you've then implicitly in that conversation said, here are my non-negotiables. Here's what I'm willing to do. Here's what I'm willing not to do. And, and then your girlfriend 
gut to decide, okay, do I, am I going to believe this person is saying what they believe, like that they mean what they say. And I think especially as women, I don't know if it's the same with a male experience, but we'll hear something, you know, at least I'll just like personally, I mean, I dated a guy years ago and on our very first date, he told me he was not interested in a long-term relationship. He had just gotten out of a long-term relationship was going through a divorce and didn't want anything serious. And I heard vulnerability. (laughs) Mm. I heard hope that I could be a part of his journey and healing process. Like I heard what I wanted to hear as opposed to this person has literally just told me that they are unavailable for me. (laughs) But I want to be there for him. Oh my gosh. And then I'm going to be there to pick up the pieces. (laughs) That's not your job anymore. No, it's not. It wasn't even your job back then. No. Yeah. I've been there. I've definitely been there. Mm -hmm. Okay. We got to stop this because we can keep going forever. We're, I'm not even going to look at the questions that people asked. Not even. Do you want to just try like, I don't know, like rapid fire, like one sentence answers or no? Okay, fine. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a pushover. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. How can I tell the guy I'm dating without hurting him that his breath stinks? <laughs> do you want a piece of gum? <laughs> really? <laughs> I, I mean, th- does that work? I feel like at least for me, if anyone ever offers me a piece of gum, I will 1000% accept it, even if I don't want it, because I'm like, they're trying to tell me my breath stinks. <laughs> yeah, but I feel like bad breath is a systemic issue. Oh, it's like an inside out job? Yeah, it's not just like a well, like a stick of gum is going to f- fix it. We're not talking, we're talking about systemic bad breath. So we're talking about whatever is that, whatever the disease is called, like, I don't know, gingivitis or something. Halitosis. Or, Halitosis. Yeah. Although I heard that was made up by the um, dental pro- industry. Pro- and big fluoride. Yeah. Um, so I would say, hey, you know what? I like you. This is the hardest thing I've ever had to say, mm. but I'm going to do it because you're worth it. And, and I enjoy going out w- with you, but your breath smells and it doesn't make me want to make out with you. Sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> your thoughts? I would not apologize for it. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. I would say, you know, if this is someone that you really like and want to be with, I also feel like I have another side thought of, I feel like there's like the primal part of us where smell is super important. And ultimately, if you don't like the smell of your partner, then it's kind of like our body's primal way of saying maybe they're not like our body's primal way of saying don't have babies with this person. So the woo side of me thinks maybe there's something to the smell. But if you are really wanting to see if there's something there with this person, then yeah, like you said, hey, I really care about you. This is, I I feel even weird bringing this up. I might hurt your feelings in saying this, but I'm really committed to an authentic, honest connection with you. And your your breath smells bad. And is there anything that we can do to to come up with a solution for that? And by we, I mean you. Yes. And by we, I mean you. Often just, you know, better hygiene. Uh, Sometimes there are medical reasons, but all right, we're not doctors. (laughs) Moving on. How and where to meet men in these times of lockdown, curfew, masked faces? I just think that you can meet people anywhere at any time. And part of that is mindset. And part of it, I think, is if you're at the grocery store, put your phone down, take your headphones out say hi to people that are around you. I understand. Let's be safe with social distance. I'm not saying go lick a person's face that's getting apples or oranges, but I just was picking up takeout a couple days ago and there was a guy sitting at the bar waiting for his takeout. And I said, Hey, how's it going? And we chatted and 15 minutes later he had my number. And so I think part of it is being open to possibility wherever you are and choosing to be present and looking up, making eye contact and smiling and being curious about another human being. I think people really are around us all the time if we are open to it. We feel similarly about this. You and I? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Oh, hey, uh, I I love ordering food here. What did you get? (laughs) Right, like. Hey, I love eating. I love eating. <laughs> I love this restaurant. What did you order? Like, 
Yeah. Really like get a little curious. Yeah. What's your favorite the... thing on the menu? Oh, really? You like that? That's, wow, a very surprising choice. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Are there any other restaurants in the area you like? I also feel like going to dog parks is the best thing ever. With or without a dog. To- yeah, you totally don't need to have a dog. Yeah, People it's not do like not a playground. It's weird. Yeah. Oh my gosh, what kind of what kind of dog do you have? Oh my gosh, I love your dog. I also feel like as a guy, if you want to be in a relationship, get a puppy and just hang out at the park or in public places. I met a lot of people when I had I, when I first had my dog, but now I'm I'm like the disgruntled dog owner where I just don't want to talk to anybody. Oh, rude. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes. He, his name is Roger. He's eight years old and he's a border collie. Um, <laughs> hound pit mix those are the three questions that people ask me right away okay great so that's the end we don't have any more questions dating someone no i've got so many questions (laughs) i was like okay the the podcast is over got it (laughs) dating someone new and still have feelings for my ex how do i shake it i mean i have thoughts do you want to share yours first or no i don't i'm done sharing thoughts. you're done sharing you're like i'm done well i would just wonder i really don't by the mindset that part of getting over your ex is meeting a new person. You mean to get over your ex, you got to yes. get under someone else? Yes. Yes. I'm like, mm, if you are not over your ex, that's okay. Perhaps take a break from the person you're seeing until you are in a place where you are mo- more emotionally available. Because I think we flip that narrative around. And if you're getting to know someone and you're really into them, but at night they're not thinking about you, they're still mourning the loss of their last relationship, then they're not emotionally available to you. And I want to be in in an emotionally available relationship and have an authentic connection. And so give yourself time and space to get over the person. Mm. And if you want to go on dates, just be honest about where you're at. Yes. Yo, I'm still not over my ex. Like, just that's just a fact, but mm-hmm. I totally want to go on dates and be distracted and quite possibly have sex if that's something yeah. that you're into. And I think so, it, some people are into that and owning it. I think that's the the point that I love is just owning where you're at. Because yeah, you can totally date and not be over your ex, but own it. Oh, own everything. Own everything. Own the fact that you want kids. Own the fact mm-hmm. you're not over your ex. Oh, and the fact that you're in love with someone who's, you know, unavailable, mm-hmm. just own it. Mm-hmm. Um, how can I get the thought of wanting a boyfriend out of my head? It's consuming. Mm. I think. <laughs> own it. <laughs> yeah, own it. I mean, I think that's the, it's like, I went to a Jason Raz concert in college and I was obsessed with him and he had to stop his concert in the middle of a song. And he was like, I'm sorry, there's this song stuck in my head. And the only way that I can get it out of is if I sing it. So he sang this random song and then he got back to his concert. Whoa. (laughs) Which I thought was amazing. And I think similarly, similarly with this is look at the desire, own it, acknowledge, okay, this is the thing that I really want. And I think part of it, when we let ourselves feel the feel, just as trauma can get trapped in our body, longing can get trapped, joy, happiness, all the feelings, let yourself feel that you long to be in a relationship. And then I think asking questions like we asked earlier in the conversation, what would it look like? Or how would you be showing up to this desire if you were showing up from a place of hope and possibility and Mm -hmm. connection as opposed to fear, lack, victim? Love it. Yeah. You nailed it. Cool. All right. Last one. I'm attracted to free spirited guys, but they never want to settle down. (laughs) And then it's the little emoji that looks like it got punched in the face. (laughs) What do I do? LOL. Well, I think you can. Well, it sounds like you're attracted to emotionally unavailable free spirited guys. Ooh, dang. Ooh. Fire. I mean, the. So, and. There are amazing free spirited, I don't know, burning man yoga. I don't know what what she's referring to. I love free spirited guys as well. I feel free spirited myself. And I think that we attract what we put out there. And so if you are constantly attracting not just free spirited, but emotionally unavailable, that means that there 
is something emotionally unavailable in you. So the free spirit, a guy that you're attracted to, is he in a relationship? Does he not want to be in a relationship? Like, I think reflect that mirror back to yourself. Like, why am I attracting emotionally unavailable men in my life? And what can I do to shift that? (sighs) Million dollar question right there. (laughs) For real. All right, Kat. Sean. Two more things. Where can we find you and how can we work with you? Yeah, I guess. Not I guess. I know that the best place for you to find me is Instagram, The Refined Woman. My website is The Refined Woman. I have a weekly podcast called The Refined Collective. And my book, Sexless in the City, comes out 420. Nice. Um, you can pre-order it now off Amazon and anywhere books are sold online. So, yeah. And what does love mean to you? Mm. Oh, that's a, you totally just like blindsided me. No, because I always end my interviews with that same question. Dude. Whoops. <laughs> Uh-oh. You're not the only one, by the way. Whoopsies. I'll just own it. Um, love is to me, oh gosh, connection, to see and be seen. I think it's acceptance. I think it's honor. Love is freedom. Expression, uninhibited expression, perhaps. Hmm. Yeah. Thank I'll leave you, it there. Thank you for your for your wisdom and for your time and for for being here with us today, Kat. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm so grateful to be chatting with you and connecting with, with your people. Thank you for spending this hour with Kat and myself today. Have a beautiful week.